Hi, everybody. I'm very excited to be here, and I'm going to try my best to tell a story of a company that has an incredible culture. Has anyone actually heard of Jellyvision prior to tonight? About half. Um, so I'm going to just talk a little bit about our history, who we are, our roots, which are really important because we had some incredibly unfair advantages compared to the typical startup. I'm going to try to define our culture and I'm going to fail miserably because I'm one of the least funny people at Jellyvision and humor is very, very important to our story. And then I'm going to give you four strategies that are our work in progress for how to maintain company culture when you grow. Why are they a work in progress? Because we're not the size of Google. We're still under 100 people and knowing whether or not we're successful in maintaining culture is a story that is yet to be written. So just talking about Jellyvision, interactive conversation company, we make virtual advisors for very big companies with a lot of money that help educate and sell and entertain and train and provide customer service. We are a 10-year-old company that truly spent the first seven and a half years in startup mode. Three very different verticals, different products, different markets, different business models. Um, spent seven and a half years trying and trying and trying to get traction. Finally got some real focus in 2007. Closed a Series B round out of Menlo Park, which you have questions about valuation. Talk to me before you sign in the Midwest. Um, uh, spent 2008, again, sort of iterating the business model. And then we finally what, got what you call traction. And if you look at our revenue, it's, it's truly a hockey stick. And that is awesome and rewarding and exciting and having new clients and lots and lots of money in the bank is really great. We doubled our revenue the last three years in a row. We have a lot more bodies. We hire more people every year than we had people three years ago. Um, and we're, we're, we're definitely a company in a scaling mode. And as fun as it is, it is also equally painful as trying to start up just, just to set expectations for the people who are in very nascent um, staged businesses. So that's Jellyvision today, about 80, 80 clients right now, half in an, in an agency um, standpoint where, hey, big company, tell us what you want to build, and we will build it. Or, and, and about 50 clients on um, Jellyvision Benefits Counselor, which is a SaaS-based business model that provides um, decision support for people making healthcare decisions from their employer. And it's, a, it's much more exciting than it sounds. But our roots, the Jellyvision Lab, um, really is an offshoot from a company that was formed much earlier, which is confusingly Jellyvision Inc. Um, Jellyvision Inc. was founded by Harry, who happens to be here today, kind of coming out of college, and it really made its name doing interactive games like You Don't Know Jack or Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, Smush, Primetime Pitch, very, very freakishly lucky and, and successful in the gaming in, uh, industry in the 90s. And our, our history is so formed by the people who started it. And, and Harry had the very usual policy in terms of starting the company of relying on nepotism and cronyism. He hired people he knew and loved. And they created a culture of very like-minded individuals who deeply cared about each other. It was not a strategy of higher complementary skills. It was hire people you really, really want to work late into the night with. And that notion of wanting to work with your friends is a core value 17 years later. Um, and that's not everybody's strategy, but that was, that was definitely a founding strategy of the Jellyvision Lab, wanting to, wanting to work with people who you consider friends. Jellyvision Inc., our predecessor, went on to be very successful, had a bunch of games, had four marriages that resulted in children based on two employees getting married out of Jellyvision Inc. to give you a sense of that kind of culture. And one of the beautiful things besides being friends that company shared was the gaming mindset and an absolute appreciation of the blue humor. Bathroom jokes are big, innuendo is big. It was not a typical um, corporate culture and that has carried forward into the Jellyvision Lab which is, is, is important for reasons I'll get to later. I joined Jellyvision Inc to be a brand manager for You Don't Know Jack, which sounds like an awesome job. And one of the first things anybody in that position would do would get, is get to know the market. So I did a lot of market research, and one of the first things I realized is, oh my goodness, the games market is about to tank in terms of the casual games. Um, big investments by Microsoft and Sega and, and PlayStation in the boxes, and not the software was happening. So all the money was going to go to girls and guns, and we did game shows. Second thing, online was the buzz du jour, but there were no business models that would actually pay developers actually in play in 2000, 2001. So one of the first things I did is sat down with Harry and said, this is, this is a really tight industry. We're going to have to really tighten the belt, let people go, and want to be in this industry to survive the next four years. And it was decided that the passion was not gaming. It was interactivity 
Jelly Vision Lab was basically put into a hiatus. It's back today, just so you know, but put into hiatus. Um, 70 people became 13. The company was reincorporated as the Jelly Vision Lab. Um, same brand, same technology platform, same approach to interactivity, but very new mission, going from virtual game show hosts to virtual advisors, insurance brokers, guidance counselors, software salespeople, whatever the case may be. So our, our founding, we hardly had the problems that the typical startup does of who are we, what are we gonna be? The people starting the company were 13 people who had worked together already for years. So that's, that's our roots and so sort of the foundation of the culture. And we talk about the culture. Um, one of our most famous examples of culture is Mustache Day. It does coincide with my birthday, which is absolutely as obnoxious as it sounds. But, but like 80% of the company grows mustaches. Some of them come in character. Uh, one of our writers was Diego Montoya from The Princess Bride all day. <laughs> I mean, this is like, and like one, a director of business development was wearing a vest, a low cut vest and nothing else. And it was creepy. I mean, it was just creepy, the commitment to really making fun and having fun for the day and mustache day. Then we go to Fogo to show, dressed in character, make a lot of noise, eat a tremendous amount of slaughtered animal. And then we come back and play murder. And that kind of emphasis on fun, that's a good example. I mean, it's not every day is mustache day, but every day there is a spirit of committing to the funny. And it's not, you know, Microsoft is a client and Aetna is a client. We work with a lot of insurance companies and, and high-tech B2B companies. And it's not their culture, but our culture is to go for it, to be the butt of the joke, to not be vanilla, to really celebrate the dumb thing. And a tremendous amount of effort is put into Photoshopping pictures for group consumption on public email. And it really, it's an art form about who can be funny. And so when it escalates, it escalates and escalates. And finally, you'll hear, like I sit outside from all the writers, you'll hear the collective groan and everyone will be like, donuts. Our corporate policy for handling with something that is a little too irreverent is you have to buy the company donuts. So. Understanding that and understanding that bathroom humor really is a big hit and one of the things the Jelly Vision Lab took from the Jelly Vision Inc. is the total celebration of having the comedic sensibilities of a 12-year-old boy and, and standing by it. Um, every senior-ish hire that comes in says liability. I'm just, I'm just giving you some feedback, Amanda. You know, you're, you're going to get sued. You, you've got to have policies and clamp this down. And I say, just wait. Just wait. Because not only is um, the humor very funny, it helps, it is never personal and it is never mean-spirited, but you haven't fully grasped what it is that keeps people here. Jelly Vision believes in being a place where you can do work that you're proud of with people that you like and respect. And part of respect is treating everybody as humanly as possible, as kindly as possible, as decently as possible. So we tell people, you're gonna see some stuff here that you wouldn't see at another company. And it is your obligation as a member of this community to talk to people when they do something that's not comfortable. You must be honest. You must be honest about jokes, about product, about process, about our business strategy. You must also be kind. And in turn, you must also listen openly and non-defensively to feedback because it's gonna come. We have lots of different perspectives. And, and it's that value, that cultural sensibility that makes us successful. It's not the fart jokes as lovely as they are. <laughs> so just wanted to talk about what really is the policy. And I'll give you an example of the culture and how the culture gets manifest in a policy. We have a document called the graceful leaving policy. It is something that people get on their first day here. And it's really weird on your first day of a new job to get a document that says, we know like all good things, this too might come to an end. And when it does, we want you to know what you can expect from us. And we outline um, what happens in terms of performance issues, what happens if the company's in financial duress, and then what we would like from you when you decide to leave. And in it, it says, tell us when you're thinking about leaving. We run extremely leanly. There is no middle management. There is no fluff. There is no fluff. And if you leave, we're kind of screwed. So what we ask is, trust us to treat you decently and show respect. So when it's time for you to leave, tell us, and we'll, we'll give you space when you're looking for your job search. We'll be your reference. We'll pay you prorated, prorated bonuses. We'll give you great assignments. We'll treat you really well. And it actually um, just happened. I was sitting down with a writer in June, and she said, you know, I just I have to tell you, I'm thinking about leaving the company, I really want to travel the world. And I said, oh, oh, oh okay, um, 
crap, that's great, it's great plans, great for your life, when? And she said, in eight months. And when you get that, you can plan. You can build a business. You can, you can move on with really core talent. And that's, that's a policy. Now we stand by it. And you know, we'll talk a little bit about how we, how we stand by it on the negative side as well. But that, that is an example of the graceful policy. We, she's helping hire her replacement. Very helpful. Um, so strategies to maintain culture as we scale. This might sound counter to this graceful leaving policy, but it's actually very much a part of it. Number one, hire slowly, fire quickly. You've heard it all before, it's not new, but it's really, really true. And when I say hire slowly, there is such pressure when the money is rolling in and the opportunity is rolling in to say, no, we don't have enough people to handle it. It is so, so tempting to just start buying bodies and buying blood and pulses to get stuff done. And it is a huge disservice to your company, your culture, your quality. Slow down, defer revenue as much as you can, ask people to work extra hard and get the right people in. We have an absolute gauntlet. Um, I actually met someone here tonight who'd interviewed at Jelly Vision. I was you know, dodging the blow I thought was gonna come. There are multiple auditions, there are group interviews, and anybody in the group interview can decline a candidate. We really make sure we get the right people as best as we can, even though there's pressure to hire. And then firing quickly doesn't mean be capricious about it, but your gut is always right when you sense someone isn't a fit in terms of talent or work ethic or judgment or cultural fit you're right and you need to begin the process of communicating it explaining how expectations aren't being met and moving on getting the people out it is toxic to have underperformers in a small community where everybody else kicks a lot of ass focus on dna not the resume our mistakes in hiring almost always come down to that thing. We get dazzled by somebody's experience. Somebody generated $10 million of sales in six months there, or did such and such, or built some kind of thing and coded such a thing. It's so hard to not get enamored by the resume, but don't do it. In fact, moving forward, we barely look at the resumes. So as part of, as part of the strategy, we, we really, really invest heavily in the cover letter. One of the things you can do as an entrepreneur is look at the typical job posting and realize how much they fail small businesses. The boilerplate marketing, this is who the company is, and then the 14 tactics that you need your robot to do are awesome for Accenture who's hiring 40,000 people next year, which they are. It is not great for someone who is hiring 16% of their company in the next hire and needs that person to not just be a skill set, but be a cultural fit. So describe your company. Do you need a coder who is a good documenter or who's super nimble? Do you want someone who tells a lot of jokes or really appreciates work-life balance and gets the heck out of Dodge at the end of the day? Tell the, kind of per the story of the company that you are and the kinds of, of people that will fit and build your, your, your culture, and then read the cover letters, insist on a cover letter that has people tell you why they think they're a fit. DNA, hiring the DNA, always comes out in the cover letter. Ignore the resume, invest, invest your time in reading the cover letter, and if you're not getting good cover letters where people put themselves out there, it's because your job description sucks, and you need to do a, good, a better job of inspiring people to care and want to put themselves out there. Hire for potential, promote from within, and realize some of your best networks are clients, partners, and vendors. Three of our top senior hires are people that we worked with, not in really weird ways. Um, one of our clients was a VP of product development. He's now our VP of sales. We had a project manager for one of our clients. She's now a director of client services for one of our biggest clients. And then our third was a producer at Disney, and he now heads our art department. So really, know who you know, who you know and think about how they could fit in your business in non-traditional ways, because when there's a click, it really is helpful. So focus on DNA, not the resume. Three, stick by your values even when it gets harder. And it does get harder. I'll give you a couple examples. We are a very, very transparent company. We talk about our revenue, our forecasts, our pipeline, our hiring plans, our risks, our concerns. We talk about it all, and not in kind of an open doorway, like come by my office and I'll answer your questions. We talk about it proactively in an all-company weekly meeting. Very, very forthright. So easy to share your hopes and dreams and fears when there are 12 people in the room. Much, much harder when there are 12 new faces in the room every week, just to give some perspective. But you've got to do it, and you've got to do it for the same reason you did in the first place, which is when you share your problems, people can share in the solution. Second example I'll give you of how it gets harder relates to something we don't talk about. We don't talk about compensation. We also don't talk about HR issues as they relate to an individual. 
And the reason why that is, and we were originally coming up with this policy, we sat down and we say, if we put you on probation, it didn't work out, and we knew you had to leave the company, how would we want it to be handled if it were us? How would we want to be treated? And I was pretty much like, oh my God, I'd want to get the heck out of Dodge as quickly as possible. Some people were like, I want to say goodbye to my friends. Other people said, I would want to work for as long as possible and have as much um, time as possible to plan my transition. Very, very different personal reactions to a traumatic situation. And our policy is to allow for as much dignity as possible and allow the individual who's going through the separation to decide how it is communicated and when it is communicated to the company makes for a super awkward situation sometimes if people are really pissed about the transition. And it would be, I've had temptations recently to be like, look, we followed the policy, didn't work out. Yes, you know, this is what happened. And you can't because it doesn't allow for the most possible dignity for the people. And you do the right thing because it's the right thing, not because it's easy or because there's quid pro quo. So I had this sort of validation moment. We had a 10th anniversary party where we invited everybody who worked at Jellyvision over the course of a decade, and even from Jellyvision Inc. to come, and we had client messages, and it was really nice. And I kind of was, had this moment to be like, oh my god, the talent in this room is awesome. And I started to do the sweep of all these people who have left such an indelible mark on our culture, and I got about three people in, and I was like, oh, I fired him. Oh my god, I fired him too. <gasps> these people all got laid off and I fired her. Oh, that was really rough. And yet they came, they came to celebrate the 10th anniversary of the company. And it could be because we very heavily publicized the catering and open bar. <laughs> it also could be because we had done our job of making Jelly Vision a place where people could do work that they are proud of with people they like and respect. And that is why I create moments of true awkwardness for the company, because sometimes you don't, and it's worth it. So stick by your values even when they get harder. Last thing, where, where's Stella? Am I out of time? Okay, great. Last, last one, embrace new rituals. Mustache day is awesome. Over my dead body will that ever go away. I love it so much. Um, but I found that, particularly with people who started together, and most of the founding team is still here, that's a long time for people to work together. There are a lot of like, ways to get kind of very set in your skin. And one of my favorite new tra uh, traditions was from very new people, and I'll talk about it and the incredible impact it can have on culture. There was a day um, before we sort of took over and moved upstairs, um, we were about 40 people were packed into a main room outside the main door to our um, suite at 848 West Eastman. And a writer, either Steve-O or Arnie, said, today is applause day. And anytime someone walks in or out of the door, everybody needs to stop what they're doing and clap. Right? <laughs> dumbest, dumbest thing ever. Dumbest thing ever. And I remember thinking, like I always do, like, oh my god, it's kind of funny, but it's really dumb. It's really dumb. Okay, it's kind of dumb. And then I proceeded to try to work all day when every now and then it would just be punctuated by this raucous applause. Peapod got boom, UPS guy, boom, someone goes to get a coffee, boom, she's like, yeah. And so I'm on the phone pitching or doing whatever I'm doing and it's like, oh, just hang on a second. Okay, okay, all right, go on. And then I finish my call and I go like beelining out to get lunch and someone goes, Amanda Lannard, everyone, and the room busts into applause. And I had sort of a threefold reaction. The first reaction was like, it's very startling when you don't expect it. And the second reaction was like embarrassment. I'm like, oh my God. And the third reaction, when you really have you know, 40 or 50 people cheering very loudly for you, is like, So you like you walk out and you're just like a little shaken and it was like the most weird collective booing effect, not just for the person who got this spontaneous applause, but for the people who did it. And there we invented this tradition of it's called clapping out. And on the end of someone's first day as a new employee at Jelly Vision, when you've done your very bestest and it's so awkward because you know you're not of any value yet, and the people who've been training you all day um, finally have to go their, do their real work instead of sitting there and explaining to you where the bathroom is. You're sitting at your desk and it's so awkward and you just want to go home and like, tell your family about the new job. You finally say to your manager, I'm leaving. You go, you think you're going to sneak out quietly. No, no, no. Someone yells, first day. Everybody leaves their offices. Everybody stops what they're doing. And you get a standing ovation all the way out the door. It is embarrassing and startling and it is very booing and it is a new ritual that we have it is baked into people's orientations so a manager knows don't, hey clap out everyone clap, clap, clap 
and then it's just part of the culture, and it's very gratifying to then, then do it to somebody else and be like, ha ha, I just survived that sucker. You know, it's, it, it, and that's, that's an example, that's new. That's not the founder, that's not people who have been here for, for eight to 10 years. That, that is a new person coming and creating something that is very, very much part of our values, but a very, very new way to express it, and I just, I'm appreciative for that. So embrace new rituals. Values are constant, but how you express and celebrate them can and probably should change. So saw a lot of entrepreneurs in the room, and I have to sort of describe my role at Jelly Vision. I am not a founder. Harry Gottlieb is the founder. He's the founder of both um, uh, Inc. and the lab. I am, I am a nurturer and a believer in culture, but I think you have to realize, and I can say this because it's not me. I'm not the founding entrepreneur. So many of the values of Jelly Vision are really an expression of Harry. Not his product, not his process, but his personality and his core values. He's funny, he's deeply kind, he's all these kinds of things. So realize that when you're starting a company, the way you act, the way you treat people, the way you do business, can have a very lasting effect, hundreds of people and millions of dollars later. So entrepreneurs, put your best foot forward, it matters. Mm -hmm.